Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. You don't need to expect us. We're already here. Most are afraid of unknown depths, skirting shores thinking world flat. I'm with the island girls in celebration of new religion. Nobody led me or said this way. I sailed alone on makeshift raft with wind as companion. Fate for deliverance, confidence enough to assess new disposition. Seekers of lost paradise may seem fools to those who never sought the other worlds. Welcome to Momentary Zen with Zen Garcia. Visit www.fallenangels.tv You're listening to Revolution Radio. I see men as trees walking. Mark 8, 24. Welcome, friends. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Momentary Zen here on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. Thank all of you for joining me this evening. I believe I have a very interesting show lined up for you. Um, I know every time I cover this issue, it's very controversial. It's one of those that whenever I discuss the topic of what occurred in the garden, how the serpent's beguilement of Eve led to the conception of Cain, that Um, those especially that are not familiar with this discourse and never have never heard about it and um, because they don't teach about it in in the mainstream seminaries the churches uh, uh, of churchianity that it's a premise which is strange and uh, also for whatever reason, I still don't understand, uh, highly contentious. And it brings out the, the, the worst in people for whatever reason. But anyways, um, and, and so because, uh, because I've been kind of, um, accused of, basically teaching doctrines of devils, uh, I thought I would address uh, some of the particulars of this issue only from the King James, because it's not necessary to go outside of the canonical material in order to assert this as truth, as I will bring forth this evening. But as I cover in the many books that I've written on this topic now, uh, that when you do, it's so evident and so very clear that this is exactly what Christ, Yeshua himself speaks about um, multiple times in Matthew 13, in John, in Luke, in so many places. Um, and same for Paul and John. And so this assertion is interwoven all throughout the scriptures. And in my opinion, it is the skeleton key for unlocking even what we see with regard to current events and world situation. And so I'm going to share an article that I wrote um, for not only this month's newsletter through Sacred Word Publishing, but also for the End Times Matrix News, uh, the September edition. It is on the root of all evil. And so I'll begin with that and then go into um, some of the aspects of this from the scripture in explaining this postulation. And again, I don't know why, for whatever reason, it is so contentious, um, but it is. And I think it's because, you know, anytime you get really near the truth, 
that as Satan does not want you to expound upon it. Um, just like they say, you know, with the whole war metaphor that when you are over the target, then, you know, you're getting bombarded uh, with a bunch of flack. And that's exactly what I've been contending with um, uh, since the publication of my fourth book, Lucifer, Father of Cain, in 2010 on this issue. But in my opinion, it is very critical for the world to know that we are not all one people and that we are not at all the same with regard to inclination or disposition. Idealistically, most of us want to believe that all people on the earth have the same regard and are concerned with the peace, harmony, goodwill, and the extension of brotherly love to all people everywhere, but that's just not the case that everyone is concerned with establishing an environment which would be beneficial for the nurturing of children of those yet unborn generations and that as these stewards of nature, life, and the world, that all would be foremost focused on preserving and bettering the ecology and environment so that it would be conducive in supporting and sustaining the life and generations of humanity going forward into the future. What most do not realize is that there exists a group of individuals which blood related to Satan are not concerned with such matters. These individuals owning most of the wealth of the world control such power that they print the money which is loaned at interest to the governments of the world. The people of those nations utilizing a central bank and which are connected to the World Bank or International Monetary Fund are subjected the responsibility of shouldering the burden of paying back individually through their incomes, wages, and earnings. The taxes imposed for them just to pay down the interest of such debt. The Illuminati secret societies who worship Satan as their God, because he is their father, have as their driving force domination control and manipulation of the world's currencies, markets, governments, and politics in bringing forth the agenda of the New World Order, trying to assert over the rest of us global governance. These individuals are so-called callous, ruthless, and emotionally disconnected from the rest of humanity that they would even, that they would, without second thought or hesitation, conspire the rape, pillage, plunder, death, murder, and annihilation of innocents on large scale, even their own family members so long as it raised, assisted them in strategic goal, the manipulation, tightening, and centralization of wealth, power, and control for further domination. The only way that current events and world situation can make sense with regard to how the underlying truth connects the esoteric, mythological, biblical, and prophetic nature of what is daily occurring in uniting all things is, I believe, by embracing that there is a spiritual component which little understood connects in theme the ancient war in heaven commenced so very long ago to what I call the great contest between Christ and Satan. This legendary battle ongoing is being waged even in this day and age. Evil the perpetuation and propagation of it is, I believe, connected to humanity's struggle against Lucifer, the rebel angels, the watchers, the giants, and the seed of Cain as fostered and manipulated by them through the centuries and even millennia of nonstop senseless war. 
Many not understanding this aspect of our historical legacy cannot comprehend why Yahweh Elohim would even allow evil to exist. Why not just end the horror of evil by striking down Satan or Cain when they were first entered into the presence of this world? We cannot make sense of the bigger picture, the grander concepts and the particulars of free will, duality, and the lesson of life with regard to pain and pleasure, good and evil, light and darkness, and need for all of it to exist as it currently is. We cannot grasp how the Lord God, because he loves us and also because he loved Lucifer and the other fallen angels, that it is because of love that he extended free will to all of us to determine through Christ our eternity, salvation, and inheritance. We are told to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Not understanding the reasons behind who we are, why we are here, and what all this is really about, most will often blame the Lord God, Christ, Christianity, and other religious institutions for establishing the control mechanism, the matrix which dividing humanity and faith utilizes controlled oppositions as means to direct the flow of madness in pinning one group of people against another. What they do not understand is that it is the powers, principalities, the rulers of darkness, and wickedness in high places, which from the shadows coordinates the cycles of order which spring from organized chaos that Satan, as the eye atop the Illuminati pyramid, controls, directs, and dictates for his own benefit the world's hatred for God, Christ, and the religious institutions. He told us very clearly long ago that his efforts for the New World Order were to establish his own throne in the sides of the north above the cloud stars and the mount of the congregation of God. His goal for rebellion was to divert, deceive, and lead astray humanity into worshiping him in being like the Most High. He is the ancient serpent, that old dragon which deceiveth the entirety of the world. Only by accepting the premise that the serpent's beguilement of Eve led to her impregnation and conception of Cain as the firstborn hybrid son of the devil, can we then be able to grasp in deeper meaning Christ's reference to Satan as the enemy which snuck into the garden and sowed as their father the tares? The war between the seed lines would be ongoing until the harvest, which with his second advent will end this conflict forevermore. Ignoring this concept, one would never be able to perceive the connections of the Pharisees to the bloodlines which conspiring his murder had throughout the ages and generations of humanity been the plotters and murderers of the prophets and the saints sent by him to direct us to truth. He said of them that they and their fathers were and are the killers of the prophets from Abel to Zacharias. Abel being the firstborn son of Adam and Eve and representing the seed of promise was murdered by his half-brother Cain. He was the first casualty of the enmity between the seed lines, which continues unabated even to this day. How can one deny that the Pharisees are the synagogue of Satan because they are the blood descendants of their father, the devil. And the reason that Christ called them a den of vipers is because they are directly connected to Cain, who being the first killer of Abel was said to have a seraphic or reptilian appearance. This serpentine characteristic is said to dominate this bloodline. 
as the patriarch which propagated this lineage, Cain is said in scripture to be of that wicked one. Isaiah in chapter 14 calls Lucifer the adversary, the abominable branch which sired through Cain and the seed, the seed of evildoers. Understanding this teaching, one will be able to make sense of who the enemy really is and how his children have traditionally through all ages perpetuated the madness we see as evil in the world. All right. Um, and I do believe absolutely that it is critical for people to understand the whole concept of this teaching to not only make better sense of scripture, but to come to terms with what we are dealing with as the elites that are sitting on the thrones of the world today and how they are all connected in bloodline to one family and that they are the children of Cain. And they even call themselves and reference themselves as such. Um, I will actually bring this up after the break, but I want to I want to tie together the connections of Lucifer, Satan, the adversary, the abominable branch, to um, to the war in heaven initially, and to death coming into being. That And also that it is declared in Psalms 82 that as the sons of God, they would die the death of men and that the sentence of death was pronounced upon them. And this is why we see in Ezekiel 28, 31, and also Isaiah 14, that it is said of Satan, the adversary, Lucifer, the fallen cherub, that he is going to die the death of a man. And so when you investigate these particular chapters and passages, it makes sense. The whole totality of Scripture comes to light in exposing how Satan had once been in heaven, how he had been in paradise, and, but that he was cast out and he was banished exiled here to the earth, just like Adam and Eve when he tempted them to eat fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they also fell and were entered into human flesh form. Same as Satan, even though he doesn't die after one lifetime like we do, he goes through and possesses the bodies of those elitists and those that are of his family line that give themselves up to possession for him to rule through. But at the end of the 7,000 years of the second world age, he will be destroyed. He will be annihilated as if he had never been, that he will be consumed by a fire from within. All right, so I'll read this first, Ezekiel 28. It says, Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. With thy wisdom and with thy understanding, thou hast gotten thee riches and have gotten gold and silver into thy treasuries by thy great wisdom and thy traffic hast thou increased thy riches and thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches therefore thus saith the lord god because thou hast sent thine heart as the heart of god behold therefore i will bring strangers upon thee the terrible of the nations and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom and they shall defile thy brightness. They shall bring thee down to the pit, and thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. Wilt thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am God? 
but thou shalt be a man and know God in the hand of him that slayeth thee. Thou shalt die the deaths of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. Now, it's interesting that I just recently did a two-part show uh, last week and the week before on the war of the giants, the 100,000 giant war, the Nephilim, the children born of the Nephilim, the fallen angels, the giants, the men of renown, how there was a war between the uncircumscribed and the circumcised, and how Baal, the false god who is Satan, how he declares to his followers to not allow themselves to be circumcised. And this was the predominant theme of the war between the, the Nephilim giants. And so, in my opinion, it shows to you here who the uncircumcised are, that they are the kings, the Nephilim giants, which ruled over the nations previous to the flood of Noah's day, which decimated 409,000 giants. And that after the establishment of Noah and his posterity, that Moses and Joshua entering into the land of Canaan and slaughtering the remaining sons of Anak, the Amalekites and Amorites that being tall as cedars, Og and Sihon and others, that this was the reason for their war against them is because they are of the seed of Cain and that the giants are specifically born from the daughters of Cain, which I've covered many times. But if it were not for the hybrid daughters of Cain already being, um, you know, partially hybrid, Genesis 3 could have never have happened. And when you really do the investigation on the fallen angels and the Genesis 6 narrative, you will see that it is replicated many times in multiple passages that it is specifically the daughters of Cain that the watchers went to in copulating and bringing forth the giants, which again, in my opinion, unless Genesis 3 happened, you could not have Genesis 6. And it is in Genesis 3, verse 15, where we have specific the beginning of the enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And so how are people going to just ignore the first three chapters and say, oh, well, the seed of the serpent didn't come about until Genesis 6, when it's very clear that it was the temptation and the begotten of Eve which led to her conceiving Cain as the firstborn hybrid son of the devil as we will get into here in just a short bit. All right, but let me be clear on uh, Satan, really, before we move further. Thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in by beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardine, topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and the gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets, and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day thou that was created. Now, this, in my opinion, shows that just as it says in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 22, speaking of New Jerusalem, it describes the 12 gates that are each a different stone for each of the 12 tribes, that this is allusion to New Jerusalem. And New Jerusalem, as I show, uh, is the city of God, and it is in paradise. It is above the vaulted dome, and it is part of the heavenly kingdom. And it says here that, that prepared in thee the day that thou was created. So the angels were with the Most High, and serving him in the heavens prior to the rebellion. 
and that when Lucifer and the one-third of the angels which joined him in rebellion, they were cast out, they were kicked out, and they were banished here to the earth. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. In my opinion, Lucifer was one of those two main cherubs that protected the entrance to paradise, which is why he was you know, able to sneak in um, because he was already appointed task of watching over paradise uh, until being banished out. That was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. As I explained, that iniquity was when uh, the mo uh, when Christ as the light of the world was introduced to the world in Genesis 1, verse 3. And that becoming jealous that this is when light and darkness separated, Lucifer being the head of the forces of darkness, Christ being the head and over the hierarchy of light. All right, just a little bit more. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as a profane out of the mountain of God, which, again, New Jerusalem is the mountain of God. It is a pyramid. And I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty, Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. It's speaking about him being cast here to the earth and that the kings, they are going to be born of his seed line. Thou hast defiled the sanctuaries by the multitude of thy iniquities. By the iniquity of thy traffic, therefore will I bring forth a fire from in the midst of thee, it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. All right. Remember, in Psalms 82, it says this, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty, he judgeth among the gods. In verse 5, they know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. But ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. This passage, they walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course, in my opinion, is a a reference to Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, where it says, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness... All right, welcome back, everybody. I'm going to kind of move a little bit quickly because I want to get to the other material, but the reason I am bringing this up is because there was a question asked of me in the Zen Garcia Eyes Wide Open group on Facebook which I will uh, now address. And it's speaking about Ezekiel 31, which as reference speaks about the Assyrian, which we know that the Antichrist is said to be an Assyrian, but um, it connects it specifically to this cedar in Lebanon. And so I'm going to, I'm going to cover that real quick. In Ezekiel 31, it says, Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches and with a shadowing shroud and of an high stature, and his top was among the thick boughs. The waters made him great, and the deep set him on high with his rivers running 
round about his plants and sent out her little rivers unto all the trees of the field. Therefore, the height was exalted above all the trees of the field, and his boughs were multiplied, and his branches became long because of the multitude of waters when he shot forth. And the fowls of heaven made their nests in his boughs, and under his branches did all the beasts of the field bring forth their young, and under his shadow dwelt all great nations. Thus was he fair in his greatness and the length of his branches, for his root was by great waters. The cedars in the garden of God could not hide him. The fir trees were not like his boughs, and the chestnut trees were not like his branches nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in his beauty. I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches, so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied him. Remember the, you know, the vanity of Lucifer, that uh, everybody looked up to his brightness with regard to the angelic hierarchy? Therefore thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast lifted up thyself in height, and he hath shot up his top among the thick boughs, and his heart is lifted up in his height, I have therefore delivered him into the hand of the mighty one of the heathen. He shall surely deal with him. I have driven him out for his wickedness, and strangers, the terrible of the nations, have cut him off and have left him. Upon the mountains and in all the valleys his branches are fallen and his boughs are broken. By all the rivers of the land and all the people of the earth are gone down from his shadow and have left him. Again, this is the, the same thing as we read in Ezekiel 28 where, uh, in, and in Isaiah 14, which we'll read, where it says all they wonder after the, the beast. Um, and... And, and because he's brought down, and as a man, he dies the death of a man. Upon his ruin shall all the fowls of the heaven remain, and all the beasts of the field shall be upon his branches to the end, that none of all the trees by the waters exalt themselves for their height, neither shoot up their top among the thick boughs, neither their trees stand up in their height, all that drink water. For they are all delivered unto death to the nether parts of the earth, in the midst of the children of men with them that go down to the pit. And so this is exactly what I was speaking about with Psalms 82 with regard to all of these sons of God that they were going to die the death of men. And so the rebel angels being cast out, Lucifer the prince uh, being cast out, they are sentenced to die the death of men because death being brought upon them at the end of the 7,000 years of the, of the Second World Age, they will be annihilated as if they had never been. I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall when I cast him down to hell with them that descend into the pit and all the trees of Eden, the choice of the best of Lebanon, all that drink water shall be comforted in the nether parts of the earth. And it's speaking about the kings here. Because again, they are the seed of the evildoers that come forth from the abominable branch. He is the father of the tares, the enemy which snuck into the garden and that sowed them, as we'll cover here shortly. They also went down into hell with him unto them that be slain with the sword and they that were his arm that dwelt under his shadow in the midst of the heathen. See, this is you know referencing not only the giants, but the later kings, uh, Nimrod, Pharaoh, um, Nebuchadnezzar, they were all bloodline related to the same family, to, to the children of uh, Canaan. They're all blood connected. To whom art thou thus like in glory and in greatness among the trees of Eden? Yet shall thou be brought down with the trees of Eden unto the nether parts of the earth. Thou shalt lie in the midst of the uncircumcised with them that be slain by the sword. This is Pharaoh and his multitude, saith the Lord God. All right. Really quick, once more, revisiting 
Um, Psalms 82, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. That again, Genesis 1, 2. I have said ye are gods and all of you are children of the most high. But ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. And again, this is uh, the prince being Lucifer in my opinion. And so the reference to Genesis 1 verse 2, and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. That is when all the courses, the foundations of the earth were out of course because everything had become destroyed from the war in heaven. And so now going to Isaiah 14, we can see that it is in this verse, in this passage, that is specific to Lucifer as the fallen cherub. It tells us how he wanted to establish his throne uh, above the stars and the clouds of God. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cast down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides in the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And this is what God says to him. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners? All the kings of the nations, because they are his children, even all of them lie in glory, everyone in his own house. But thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch. Now this is very important because this abominable branch connects to the family tree and to men looking, walking as trees. I see men as trees, uh, which I open the whole show with. And as the raiment of those that are slain thrust through with a sword, thou that go down to the stones of the pit as a carcass trodden under feet. Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial, because thou hast destroyed thy land and slain thy people. The seed of evildoers shall never be renowned. Prepare slaughter for his children for the iniquity of their fathers, that they do not rise nor possess the land nor fill the face of the world with cities. This verse, this passage, this chapter is the same thing as Matthew chapter 13 where Christ speaks about the enemies that snuck into the garden um, but let both grow together until the time of the end and then he would send the angels out as reapers to gather the tares for condemnation and burning and the wheat for preservation this is the Lord God the Father declaring uh, war against the seed of the evildoers, the children of this abominable branch. Passage 29. Rejoice not thou, whole Palestinian, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken. For out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice, and his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent. The serpent's root, again, that is the abominable branch. The the enemy that sowed them is the devil. And so he is the serpent's root. The cockatrice that came forth, that is Cain. And so, uh, which is referenced in 1 John chapter 3, verse 12, where it says, Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew, slew he him? because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Now, there's other variants to this. It says, uh, don't be like Cain. He was a child of the evil one and murdered his brother. A, a different translation, the Weymouth New Testament. We are not to resemble Cain, who was a child of the evil one. 
and killed his own brother. And when you look at these particular verses and the specifics of that particular ch uh, chapter in the Strong's, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one and slew his brother. Here, the word of in Greek is the number 1537 in the Strong's. When used, implying a person, it means a son or an offspring of. And so, you know, again, not as Cain, who was the son of that wicked one or the offspring of that wicked one. And so, you know, again, I know a lot of people, they go directly to Genesis chapter four to try to discredit this. But again, it's my opinion that they're not understanding the full context of this teaching to understand what is being implied in Genesis four and why it is found in the chapter where Cain's lineage is separated from that of Adam's lineage in Genesis chapter 5, and that the differentiation between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent as characteristic and inclination is why these two people, these two groups, these two lineages are separated. And, you know, again, anybody that examines this with open mind and looks at it in great detail, you will find that this is exactly what is being implied within the King James. Reading a couple of commentaries about 1 John 3, verse 12, the Wycliffe Bible commentary says, he, Cain, is said to have belonged to the family of the wicked one. Matthew Poole's commentary on the Holy Bible, quote, which showed him Cain to be of that wicked one, of the serpent's seed. So early was such seed sown and so ancient the enmity between seed and seed. Matthew Henry's commentary, it showed that he, Cain, was as the firstborn of the serpent's seed, end quote. So again, I'm not making this up. Um, when you examine and understand the context of just some of the chapters and verses in Genesis uh, and 2 Corinthians, 1 John, Matthew 13, Isaiah 14, all of these things are speaking about what occurred in the garden with the beguilement of Eve which is what we're going to look at next. When, again, in looking at this, Paul, he references in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2 and 3. He says, For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And so the Paul is connecting here that the serpent's beguilement of Eve led to her not being a chaste virgin, which anybody, I mean, even if you have never heard of this concept, you don't know anything about it, you know that the only way a woman can lose her chastity, lose her virginity, and become unpure is by being sexually, physically seduced. And the only way that she can be impregnated is to have taken part in some kind of carnal act uh, where intercourse had taken place and seed was planted within her. It's the only way children can be born or, or if there's some kind of artificial insemination. But otherwise, a, a physical sexual act has to take place for a woman to lose her chastity or a child to be born. Now, everybody can agree on that, right? All right. And just to be clear, uh, that this is what happened 
I'll read a verse, a couple of verses which clarify that this is exactly what occurred to Eve and that it was historically known by the, the people, uh, the Hebrews, that this is what occurred to Eve. In Maccabees chapter 4, verse 6 through 8, it says, The mother of seven sons expressed also these principles to her children. This is a Solomonia, who was the mother of Rabbi uh, Eleazar that was tortured in the book of Maccabees. And she's recounting the story of Eve and how she was not a pure virgin, whereas she was, uh, meaning her, Solomonia. Says Quist, uh, the mother of seven sons expressed also these principles to her children. Quote, I was a pure virgin and did not go outside my father's house, but I guarded the rib from which woman was made. No seducer corrupted me on a desert plain, nor did the destroyer, the deceitful serpent, defile the purity of my virginity. In the time of my maturity, I remained with my husband, and when these sons had grown up, their father died. And so, again, she is referencing the fact that they all knew and it had been taught to their people that Eve had was an adulteress, which even the name for woman, ish, ish, uh, when you look up the word for woman, it has in its definitions implications to adulteress. And so referencing the woman in Genesis chapter 3 one of the definitions for the term woman is the adulteress. And, you know, you can't make all this up. All right, continuing. Now, a, a passage from the Protoevangelium of James, where Joseph, coming home, finding Mary already pregnant, uh, recounts the story of Adam. He says, now it was the sixth month with her, and behold, Joseph came from his building, and he entered into his house, and found her great with child, and he smote his face and cast himself down upon the ground on sackcloth, and wept bitterly, saying, With what countenance shall I look unto the Lord my God, and what prayer shall I make concerning this maiden? For I received her out of the temple of the Lord my God, a virgin, and have not kept her safe. Who is he that hath ensnared me? Who hath done this evil in mine house, and hath defiled the virgin? Is not the story of Adam repeated in me? For as at the hour of his giving thanks, the serpent came and found Eve alone and deceived her. So hath it befallen me also. And so Joseph is, is uh, distraught that Mary is pregnant. And he recounts the story of Adam saying that just as Adam, uh, you know, found Eve already pregnant, um, that same with him, that he found Mary pregnant. But we know that Mary uh, had conceived by the Holy Spirit, whereas uh, Eve was beguiled by the serpent, as it says here. For at the hour of his giving thanks, the serpent came and found Eve alone and deceived her. So hath it befallen me. And so it's common knowledge, even Tertullian and some of the church fathers speak about how Eve's beguilement is what led to uh, Cain's wickedness and his murder of Abel. You can find all of that in my uh, 12th book, The Great Contest, Enmity Between the Seed Lines. Cover it in very great detail within that particular book. All right. Now, I'm going to continue um, to Genesis 3, 15. Because, again, this is the chapter, the verse, where you find the beginning of the enmity between the serpent, Satan, the adversary, Samael, the angel of death, and the the woman which is the children and the seed of eve 
Now remember, um, Adam and Eve had hid themselves that after they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they were ashamed, they were embarrassed, and they hid themselves. First, they covered their genitals with fig leaves. And then they, being embarrassed, they hid themselves from the Most High God because they knew they had transgressed and they had done the one thing he had commanded them not to do. And so, looking at Genesis, uh, all right, we'll be right back and then we'll pick it up. All right, welcome back, everybody, for a second hour. And so, picking up with the first Genesis 2, verse 25, where it says, And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. And so, they had no problem with being uh, naked and hanging out in the garden of God and uh, just doing their thing. And and it wasn't until the serpent beguiled Eve and tempted her to eat fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, that she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And so as I explain and as I cover this in my books, that when they touch the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that that is when they their bodies are transformed into human flesh. They take on human physicality. They become mortal. Their genitals appear, and then Satan, like a, a pedophile looking for the opportunity to take advantage of a, a young girl, he pounced upon Eve, and in that moment, in, involving himself in a sexual act with her, he impregnated her with Cain. And Adam taking of the fruit and eating also was his repeating the act that he had witnessed Satan and Eve engaged in, and then that is what resulted in the birth of Abel. It wasn't some kind of a, a threesome or a sexual orgy as so many people uh, try to say that I teach. Uh, I don't. Uh, but that Adam repeating the act with Eve, that that is what resulted in the, in the birth of Abel and Cain and Abel as fraternal twins. Then you go to verse 7, and the eyes of both of them were open, meaning that they recognized that they had lost their bright nature, that they had been carnally corrupted, and they knew that they were naked, meaning that understanding they had uh, that having genitals and being in human form and having just engaged in a sexual act uh, Eve with the serpent and then Eve with Adam, that they had done exactly what the Most High had told them not to do, to eat fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And being embarrassed, they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Why? To cover their genitals. Because, again, they were embarrassed. Remember that in Genesis chapter 2, they were naked and not ashamed. Verse 25. But here, after eating this fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, all of a sudden, they find reason to cover their genitals, which in, to me implies that eating fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that somehow it had direct relation with them using their genitals 
in some manner their genitals were involved. Which again, in my opinion, is the only way uh, when you connect it to a sexual act, that's the only way that Eve could have become pregnant with Cain. There's no other manner than intercourse, physical sexual copulation, that a woman can become pregnant and conceive a child. No other way. I mean, and yet everybody says that this is not in the scriptures, but it's absolutely clear that it is when you examine it with open mind. All right, and so then the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Not that he did not know, because he knew, but he knew what had already happened as well. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He knew that I was naked. I just engaged in a sexual act. I ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I did exactly what you told me not to. And so I decided to hide myself then, rather than, you know, own up to the fact that I'd committed sin. And he said, who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree? So here God tells him, tells us that their being naked is connected to his having eaten from the tree, whereof I commanded that thou should not eat. And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. See, if, and it says this in some of the different scriptures, that if he would have just confessed his sin, and that he, instead of, instead of you know, pushing the blame off onto the woman, that if he had manned up to what he did, that the Most High would have forgave him. But they, they didn't. They did not repent. They went through this whole blame game. And then the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And so that's when we see in Genesis chapter 3, verse 14, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And so if the serpent had just tempted them to eat an apple, why would the Lord God be so angry with them? saying that because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. And so there's some serious repercussions here. This action was not just another one of the, oh, he made, he made them eat some fruit that they weren't supposed to eat. No, he taught them and engaged them in sin, same as the watchers did to the daughters of Cain in teaching them and beguiling them and being driven to take wives of them. Same thing as what occurred here. That Satan and what happened in the garden was the pretext for exactly what we see in Genesis chapter 6. And so here's the verse. I mean, there's no getting around this. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. And so here, eating fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which the Lord God connects directly to uh, their being naked, he tells them, I will put enmity, tell Satan, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. Seed, that word seed, when you look it up in the Strong's Concordance, the word is zera, um, meaning, which means figuratively, Plant, sowing time, posterity, or carnally, child, offspring, descendants, posterity, children, semen, virally, 
fruitfully seed time or sowing time. And when you look up the word for fruit, it is perie. And it means literally or figuratively to produce of the ground, offspring, children, progeny of the wound, fruit, actions, or figuratively reward. And so both of them tell you that they're eating fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the enmity between thy seed and her seed, it's specific to posterity, children, offspring, descendants, and to the sexual act which took place in order for there even to be children born. Uh, I, I mean, is that not clear? How do you get around that? Where did the serpent get seed from if he did not beguile Eve and and having her eat fruit, you know, bared with her offspring, children, progeny of the womb? Which again, if you want to deny that, you go to Genesis chapter 16, I mean, Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And so if you want to deny that the serpent has seed, and that the, the serpent's beguilement of Eve is what led to her eating fruit which led to you know progeny and the birth of uh, the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent here the lord god tells you specifically that her the result of her having eaten this fruit that it would lead to greatly multiplying her sorrows and her conception which again, you look up those words in the Hebrew, uh, it has everything to do with a sexual act. Let's look at some of the words, some of the Hebrew words. Touch is the word naga, which when you look it up, it means to touch lay the hand upon for any purpose or euphemistically to lie with a woman. Eat. Look up the word eat. It mean, it's the Hebrew word akal. To eat literally or figuratively. Consume, devour, feed can also mean to lay with or enjoy something as good fortune, sexual pleasures, or the fruit of good or evil actions. I mean, anybody that looks up the Hebrew, I mean, if it doesn't become clear to you, I, I just, uh, I, I just don't know. I mean, how, how can you deny all these? I mean, this multiple witnesses, and more than three witnesses, even just the words for touch, eat, fruit, and seed. That's four witnesses right there. But yet, I'm the crazy one. All right, let's continue. Beguiled. The word is nasha. It means to lead astray, mentally to delude, or morally to seduce, beguiled, deceive, greatly, or utterly. Enmity, extreme hostility, hatred between the seeds. Again, what is the seed? The word is zara, figuratively, fruit, plant, sowing time, posterity, carnally, children, offspring, descendants, posterity, children, semen, virility, fruitful, seed time, sowing time, everything to do with, with uh, sowing seed. Uh, not in the ground, but in the womb, which is what brought forth children. 
It's the only way that you can bring forth children. Even planting seed in the ground, you're, you're not going to bring forth children. It has to be planted within a woman's womb. No other way. All right. Again, the, the word for woman is sha, feminine, irregular, nashim, a woman, adulteress, each, every female, many, none, one, together, wife, woman. That's what the word means. And so when it speaks about the woman, the woman thou gave me, it's meaning the substitute adulteress there. Let's go back to that. And so, um, and the Lord God said unto the adulteress, what is it thou that hast done? And the adulteress said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. I mean, come on, is it not clear? All right, Eve meaning life giver. She was the mother of all the children of men. Why? Because she bears both the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. She is the mother of Cain, the firstborn son of the devil and also Abel, the firstborn son of Adam. Looking at the words uh, of the curse, the punishment for her eating the fruit. Conception, the word is hyron in the Hebrew. It means pregnancy, conception, physical conception. Is that not clear? I mean, the fruit leads to her bearing children, becoming pregnant. How else does a woman get pregnant than to be sexually uh, engaged in copulation and to have seed plowed, um, uh, sown within her womb? The word for bring forth, yalad, to bear young, Causatively, to beget, medically, to act as a midwife, specifically to show lineage, bear, beget, birth, born, to make, to bring forth children, young, bring up, calf, child, come, be delivered of a child, time of delivery, gender, hatch, labor, do the office of a midwife, declare pedigree, be the son of, woman, in woman, travaileth i mean come on the word desire is tashuka in the original sense of stretching out after a longing a desire so again you have all these hebrew words implying that the serpent's beguilement of eve was his sexually physically copulating with her, which is why, again, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 11 that the serpent's beguilement of Eve is what led to her not being a chaste virgin. And so... Um, after, you know, after Abel is murdered by his half-brother, we see that Adam, knowing his wife again, she brings forth Seth, whose name means compensation, replacement, resurrection, uh, substitute. For God, she said, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And then we see that in Genesis chapter 5, verse 3, that Adam lived 130 years, begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. That Cain is said to have been of a different appearance, that he had a serpentine, a seraphic appearance, and that he was unlike um, his father, well, his stepfather, Adam, 
but he looked like the the serpent Satan that he bore resemblance and this is also the Pharisees they were called a den of vipers all these the that ancient dragon that old serpent which deceiveth the whole world all these serpentine references they are connecting Cain to Satan I mean there's no other way around it who is the serpent he is Samael, the angel of death, Satan, the adversary. And if people study this in great detail, as I have, I've written two books about it, uh, over 400 pages uh, in one of them. The other is 360-something. So 700 pages of material on this topic. I mean, Think about that, 700 pages of sources and references which affirm this as truth. That, you know, I could write a whole book about this just from the canonical material. But again, when you add into and examine the extra biblical text, it becomes absolutely clear that this is what the scriptures are stating. You know, I, I like to read and look at the Targum references, uh, the Aramaic translation of the Hebrew Torah, that when you study those, you get great clarity as to what is being referenced. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, Genesis chapter 5, 3 here, where we're talking about how Cain was not in Adam's likeness. It says, and Adam lived 130 years, begat Sheth, who had the likeness of his image and his similitude. For before had Hava born Cain, who was not like to him, and Abel was killed by his hand. And Cain was cast out, neither is his seed genealized in the book of the genealogy of Adam. But afterwards there was one born like him, and he called his name Sheth. You know, even looking at the names, Cain, Cain, it means possession or acquired, which is exactly what happened when Adam took Eve to wife and she had already born Cain from, you know, her having uh, been an adulteress and uh, frolicking in fornication with Lucifer, Satan the adversary, that this is where Cain came from. And so Cain, meaning possession, he was acquired as a stepson for Adam, which is why he named him as such. And so, I mean, it's, it's very, very clear. Uh, I'm going to reference again the reason why we see Genesis 4.1 being at the very beginning of the chapter where Cain's progeny is separated is because Genesis 4.1 is not affirming that Adam knowing Eve is what led to the conception of Cain. But it's actually referencing her having desired the angel and having been beguiled by the serpent that this is the reason she conceived and bare Cain. And again, studying the Targum, you get great clarity on this. From the King James, it says, and Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. In the Targum, it says, and Adam knew Hava, his wife, who had desired the angel, and she conceived and bare Cain. And then she said, I have acquired a man, the angel of the Lord. And she added to bear from her husband, Adam, his twin, even Abel. And so there we have her eating the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is Satan, and then sharing that fruit with her husband, Adam, repeating the sexual act that Abel was born. And so you have these two fraternal twins, Cain, the firstborn son of the devil, which is why his being the patriarch of the tares they are separated and found listed in Genesis chapter 4. And in 
Genesis chapter 5, that is where the generations of Adam are found in listing. This whole story, when we come back from break, this whole story is repeated by Christ. He tells you multiple times in Matthew chapter 13 that this is what occurred. And so, um, as I said, when we come back from break, we'll go into this in greater detail. And then we'll link this specifically to his declaration that the Pharisees are the descendants of the lineage which are the murderers of the prophets from Abel to Zacharias. I mean, Cain was the murderer of Abel. There's no denying it. All right, we'll be right back. All right, I want to touch upon just a couple other things really quickly. Uh, in my opinion, again, if, if when you study the fullness of Scripture, you realize that Adam and Eve, they were in paradise, and that Satan and the rebel angels, that they had also once been in paradise. That this is where New Jerusalem, the city with the 12 gates made of these different stones, that this is where the righteous now are. And that this is in the third heaven, as Paul says in Corinthians, that paradise is at the third heaven. This is confirmed by multiple witnesses, Isaiah, Enoch, uh, Peter, others as I cover in great detail in this new book on paradise, the sides of the north and the mount of the congregation. And so in verse 21, where it says, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. He, this is not him giving them animal clothes or the skin of animals, but he actually clothes them in human flesh mortality because they lost their bright nature and then the lord god said behold the man has become as one of us to know good and evil and now lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever therefore the lord god sent him forth from the garden of eden to the till the ground from whence he was taken his body was made of dust from the earth it was his spirit that was blown into it and it was to the earth that they were banished and exiled. Because the tree of life is in the paradise of God, as it says in Revelation 2. And the, the paradise of God is in the third heaven. And so it is from the paradise of God from which they fall. This is why Christ says in Revelation 2 also, Remember from whence thou art fallen that we fell from paradise. That is our former estate. And we were cast down here to the earth where the rebel angels had already been banished to. This is why we find ourselves in living in the midst of these devils and demons surrounded by legion. And then he, after he drove out the man, he placed at the east of the garden the of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. And so again, we fell from paradise just as the rebel angels were cast out from paradise. Uh, as it says, as I covered in Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14, that uh, he wants to ascend to the, you know, to the throne of God above the mount of the congregation, but yet Satan was cast down to the sides of the pit. He was banished here to the earth. Same thing happened to Adam and Eve. They were exiled here to the earth. And when you look at the and study this in the first book of Adam and Eve, it tells you they didn't even understand how to walk. They did not understand human nature or physicality in any manner. They had never experienced darkness or the sun. And so all of these things were new to them once they were banished here to the earth. And this is where it took place. And when you read the Targum, again, you get much greater detail 
as to the differentiation between paradise and the Garden of Eden, which is why I always recommend people study the Targum. All right, I think I'm back. Um, we had a hiccup in the system there, but all right. So returning, I wanted to cover one other thing that after Cain had killed, uh, or before Cain has killed his brother, the most high goes to him and says, and the Lord said unto him, Cain, why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And so here, um, the Lord God is telling him, even though you're a child of the devil, if you do good, you will be accepted. This is the same thing for all the Illuminati families, all those that are born into these uh, serpent seed lines, those that are part of the tares, that if you do good, you can be counted with, and numbered amongst the elect. What determines our eternal inheritance is grace through Christ, and that salvation and our eternity is determined by whether we accept him as Savior and Messiah, and that we follow the commandments, and that we walk in his example, that we walk the narrow way and not the broad path of destruction. And that so many um, believe that, you know, that they can continue to sin after accepting him as Savior Messiah and that somehow they you know, will be numbered among the elect, uh, in my opinion, you're wrong. And it displays this in Matthew chapter 7 where Christ says to those that come to him, away from me, you workers of iniquity, I know you not. The elect is but a few. And so don't deceive yourself that you can accept him and then continue sinning uh, because just as he said to the the adulteress that they brought, him, you know, for them to stone, they giving him a stone. And he said, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. They all walked away. They were all sinners. But yet they wanted to judge and condemn her. He told her to go forth and sin no more. And so when you accept Christ as Savior Messiah, you have to be born again in spirit. You have to become changed and you have to be transformed away from your carnality into a spiritual nature. And then uh, following in his example, then you would be worthy of being numbered amongst the elect. And so this is what it is saying here to Cain and to all those, whether you're born as a seed of promise, a seed of perdition, a child of wrath, or a child of the woman, it doesn't matter which seed line you're born into. What matters is accepting Christ as Savior Messiah and then following in his example. All right, I'm going to get to Matthew chapter 13 because we're going to quickly run out of time. Because Christ tells you in this chapter, I mean, you don't need any other teaching from any other material. Just visiting Matthew chapter 13, you get the fullness of what exactly happened in the garden. It says here, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares amongst the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also, that meaning when the children were born. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, 
an enemy hath done this. Remember, the enemy is the wicked one, which we'll clarify that in just a minute. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat unto my barn. The reason the Most High didn't just kill Satan or Cain, but gave them a reprieve and put on Cain a mark of protection for seven generations was so that they could propagate the tares and allowing both to grow together until the time of the end. This is also why he preserved a remnant of not only the giants, but of the seed of the Cain through the flood of Noah's day. Both would have continuance until the time of the end, which is the second advent. And when he returns for second coming, that's when this war, the enmity between the seed lines, will finally be completed. Just to make sure, I mean, you can read all the fullness of chapter 13, but just to clarify after the multitudes are sent away and he's no longer speaking in parables, the apostles come up to him and ask him, declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. And in some verses it says, we know it not. He answered and said unto them, this is without parable, this is direct explanation. He's speaking to the apostles directly. He answered and said unto him, he that soweth the good seed is the son of man, meaning the children of Adam, which is why it says Adam is a son of God in Luke chapter 3. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy, meaning the enemy which snuck into the garden that sowed the tares, and also the enemy uh, which, you know, Cain, who was of that wicked one, the enemy that sowed them is the devil. Does it get any clearer than that? The enemy is the devil. The enemy that sowed the tares is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend in them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Because it's at, after the harvest that the elect go on to reign with him in the millennial kingdom. When new Jerusalem comes down from heaven, and we reign here on earth with him, or those that are counted worthy. And just to make sure that people understood, he goes into this twice more. In verse 47, Matthew 13, again, the kingdom of heaven, he's saying to the apostles, all right, if you didn't understand that as clear as it was, that the devil, the enemy, is the one that sowed the tares. Let me sum it up for you a couple more times, just, just to bring the message home. Okay, just in case that wasn't at clear enough for you, let, let's bring it home one more time. Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus saith unto them, Have ye understood all these things? They say unto him, 
yay, Lord. And so, I mean, really, you, you don't get that? You don't understand that the enemy, the devil, is the father of the tares? I mean, it doesn't get any clearer. I, I don't understand how you can explain it with any greater clarity or any simpler than the field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. Okay. But I understand that, you know, for whatever reason, a lot of people don't want to accept the premise of this teaching and will not embrace it in any manner. One last thing, because this, again, will nail it. He says, I know that you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and you do that which you have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus, Jesus saith unto them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus saith unto them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. Okay, because ye are not of God. Now, I want to skip forward because I know I'm running out of time, but I want to cover this. Uh, he says in Luke chapter 11, Truly ye bear witness that ye allow the deeds of your fathers, for they indeed killed them. And ye build the sepulchres, therefore also said the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they shall slay and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. From the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, which perished between the altar and the temple. Verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. Woe unto you, lawyers, for ye have taken away the key of knowledge. Ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering ye hindered. And he said these things unto them. The scribes and the Pharisees began to urge them vehemently to provoke him to speak of many things, laying wait for him and seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they might accuse him. Going to the Matthew of this particular verse. If we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. How can you escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them ye shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Barakai, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say all these things shall come upon this generation. Now, he says, from righteous Abel to Zacharias. So the Pharisees and their fathers are the murderers of the prophets. From Abel to Zacharias. Who murdered Abel? Cain. And 
who are they the children of? They are the seed of the serpent, the Canaanites, the children of Cain, who uh, uh, was born of the fornication, the beguilement the, of Eve by the serpent. And that's why he says of them, ye are of your father, the devil. He very literally meant it. And so how do you get around this? That they are connected to the lineage that killed righteous Abel all the way to the blood of Zacharias. Who is that? It's the Canaanites. And so how can you deny this? The enemy that sowed the tares is the devil. You know, the children of the tares are the children of the devil. They are the generations, the murderers of the prophets that killed from righteous Abel to the blood of Zacharias, son of Barakai, whom they slew between the temple and the altar. I mean, it's so very clear. But yet, if you don't want to see it, it's the same thing as a, uh, you know, the whole thing with the flat Earth cosmology and geocentricity. If you don't want to see it, you ignore it and continue to try to filter the teachings through your belief. But the truth stands self-evident, and the scriptures explain themselves. And it is very clear that Cain is the seed of the serpent, and that Eve's temptation to eat fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that the reason she lost her chastity, her virginity, her purity, was because she engaged herself in sexual corruption and taking on the physical copulation with the serpent became pregnant with Cain, which is why the punishment was that she would be led into sorrowful conception. Doesn't get any clearer than that. God bless all. Radio at 